And I'm Allison Goodman. I'm a senior principal engineer uh, at Intel. I work in our Optane uh, division, Optane products, and I'm also the director for Optane Solutions Group. And I'm joined here by Vivek, and I'll let him introduce himself. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. I'm Vivek Sarathi. Um, I'm a product lead in our data center group uh, focused on disaggregated architecture and storage technologies. You've been listening to many thought leaders I know share their innovative cloud software solutions. And sadly, I am here to talk to you about innovation in cloud plumbing. <laughs> so um, this is sort of the stuff that we never think about or want to think about uh, until it's not working and it stops being invisible. Uh, and so if you bear with me for a few minutes, um, I'm going to take a trip into some considerations for the plumbing of data and storage in the cloud. And then we'll get to some interesting customer examples and I'll share one and Vivek will share one um, about how their plumbing uh, is working. A little legal disclaimer for what I'm going to share. Uh, so we've got a, a brilliant data scientist here who's asking for some high performance data store and retrieval at scale. And when I say at scale, I mean, this is really, you know, hyperscaler type of scale, you know, that massive scale in the cloud. Where time to insights is real money and it depends on deterministic latencies and you're paying for how quick you can get that response. And accuracy and results is about capturing and computing more data that's using more customized near time, real near real time analytics. And that data scientist wants this durable, fast storage and a lot of it, right? Um, at least every data scientist I've talked to just wants like more, more data faster is kind of the theme. Uh, and then on, on the right side, uh, we have our cloud infrastructure architect who really wants to make the data scientist happy. Um, you know, and is starting to think through all of these requirements, um, the cost to performance trade-offs, how to get, you know, the pooling, the redundancy, the cost effectiveness of remote storage but make it appear fast and local. Um, and it's not really you know, fast and local most of the time. It also needs to appear fast and local for those periodic unplanned peaks. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, dynamics um, in, in many of the workloads uh, that that data scientist cares about and, and doesn't want a lot of variability. Uh, how is it typically done right now, today? Uh, so the cloud storage is typically implemented starting with a compute node uh, where you have uh, your apps running on there. Usually you've got plenty of local storage. Uh, then you've got a replication of those nodes um, and that, uh, that replication also has local storage, just providing that durable persistent data, low latency to the application. And then you have some capacity storage um, which is usually a uh, slower storage connected over the network. Um, and the local compute storage is sized typically based on like the highest potential need of a single server or an application, which means that most of the time, you know, you're probably only using 15 to 25% utilization on deployment. Um, and that's a lot of wasted capacity during normal operations. And then the CapEx investment um, for that sand based architecture is also really high, especially when you can't predict your future growth well, you're kind of, you're always sort of buying, buying to oversize. And the cloud architects, uh, you know, know that they need to scale, they need to get a better use of resources uh, for cost efficiency. Um, and this is really the framework that's driving that disaggregation, which kind of leads uh, sort of the meat of this, which is like, how do we get to this newer, better plumbing um, uh, that gets us uh, the right balance of that performance and that scale without all, all of this sort of waste that's, that's in the system today and kind of continuing to grow as we need more data. So our cloud architect is back considering uh, the options to meet the customer requirements with improved costs and improved resource uh, utilization. And sort of the initial, the initial thing is really to just start pooling resources. Okay, well, I'm gonna start pooling, pooling resources together because then I can get more of uh, that efficiency of aggregation. And you do that by starting to separate the storage from the compute. So you're aggregating more storage together and then you can start to scale, obviously, the compute nodes and the storage nodes independently, right? So this is the basis of just disaggregated storage that um, allowing you to scale up and to, to scale out. Um, and just connecting the compute to the data and adding this durability and redundancy is, is a 
is the first part of the solution and a big chunk of the solution. Uh, I find though it's not the most interesting one for me. <laughs> Where it gets a lot more interesting is how to provide the efficiencies of disaggregation with this performance that makes it look invisible. So that as, you, as you're traversing this memory and storage hierarchy in this IO path, the, the system, you know, the software in the system actually has different expectations for how long responses will take. And I call these the, the IO cliffs. Um, and there, there's a lot of, uh, of dependency, system dependencies and software dependencies. So this is fairly generalized, uh, but you can see in these buckets, they're, they're big step downs. Once your system design exceeds certain latency thresholds for local memory or local storage, you know, your software your application kind of has no choice but to treat it like remote memory or treat it like remote storage, which inherently just means longer SLAs. So now you're looking at these, uh, you know, service level agreements as this latency that the app is waiting for can be 10 to even 100 times longer, depending on where you fall in that window. Um, and that goes back to something that's noticeable. You, you see that type of, of longer latency at the application side, at the user side. And this problem isn't necessarily unique to cloud. You know, enterprise and hybrid cloud also has this struggle. Uh, you just argue that you, know, this, you look at the scale, um, scale on the cloud side. So how do you get creative and solve and mitigate these IO cliffs while still getting the benefits of disaggregated storage? Well, <laughs> you have to think about hardware. And I realized that um, nobody really wants to think about hardware or hardware choices because you want it all to be abstracted. Um, and I'm gonna argue for a minute on this slide that uh, the ingredients you choose to lay the foundation um, is, is, that foundation is what you could really truly innovate and differentiate over. So if you kind of make the right baseline hardware ingredient choices, then you can spend all your time um, you know, in software and abstraction and, and get what you want out of it. And this, this disaggregated storage target, so as you disaggregate the storage and now you have this target, that target is actually a solution in and of itself. It, it has a combination of compute and networking and storage. Um, your storage compute is really offloading from that application compute node. And then the faster networking uh, and the Optane memory are the breakthrough technologies that, that, that kind of give you these tools to unlock the performance um, and help you solve that IO cliff conundrum um, that, I, that I called out previously. So if I just uh, look for a second on uh, this moving data faster in this 100 gigabit, uh, gigabit E, you know, that provides roughly 12 gigabytes per second of, of throughput. And really it's only about half a microsecond of latency. And then with NVMe over Fabric protocols, with uh, RDMA, with NVMe over TCP IP, you know, these are all now recently ratified, they're approved industry st standards, and you can then really start to optimize latency. So if those, those standards and protocols allow you to take more latency out, and now you, you can get a transaction down to about 15 to 30 microseconds. And if you, if you think back to the cliffs um, that I showed previously, that, that type of time for transaction has, is still in the window of local storage. So you're kind of in that window as long as you can get fast enough low latency responses from your storage. And that's really where we get um, to Optane, sort of my, my bottom of my balancing circle here. Uh, Alison, I have yeah. a question here. Of course. I mean, uh, don't you miss something in this picture, including, you know, the, uh, what they now call DPUs? I mean, FPGAs uh, and all the others things that make, you know, uh, uh, offload compute tasks from the general purpose CPUs, because you can have very fast CPUs, but actually they are not designed to, you know, do particularly well on a very specific task. So uh, why are you not talking about GPUs, FPGAs, and all the other companies that we see more and more often now in the discussion with our clients? Yes. So I would say uh, that is very much part of the picture. Um, and to be fully comprehensive, you know, it falls in that, you know, compute performance made flexible. You could probably expand that out to be comprehensive of, of all that we're seeing in that FPGA and IPU space. And I will tell you that for the purposes of, uh, of sticking within my allotted time, because I could probably give you a whole other <laughs> um, chat about uh, how we're doing that offload, especially in this disaggregated storage space. 
um, where there are some very specific tasks that work well with some more focused compute than, than only general. Um, so I kind of just took the um, uh, focus more on the networking and blockchain side. Uh, you're correct, though, that I would add that sort of in where you see the uh, the Xeon and the compute performance, that it's a it's an alternative and additional aspect there. Allison, uh, do you see a storage, disaggregated storage with both Optane SSDs and Optane mem PMEM kinds of solutions? Yes. I mean, it seems like it would be overkill and it's sort of overlapping uh, latency and, and IOPS and all that other stuff, right? Yeah, you know, so uh, I say yes, I see them. And what I actually see is is that our our customers are are typically making a choice um, between one or the other just based on what works best with their architectural choices. And so, um, uh, you know, if I, if if I just focus on on sort of I you know DRAM's expensive, the capacities don't scale. You know, NAND's cheaper and it scales a lot. And then you see kind of wedged in there, right? The two Optane products, the Optane Persistent Memory and the Optane SSDs. Um, and, and they're both filling the gap. And, and what, we're, what we're seeing, and I'll get to it a little bit and Vivek will talk about it too in, in our customer examples is um, it really just depends on whether or not the software is, is set up more today to do that, that right buffering um, as block store, um, or if it's more of trying to optimize, you know, metadata store or some smaller um, uh, block store, how much compute you're able to, to capture with it. Um, using the persistent memory, you get higher performance. It does require some more compute resources um, versus making the trade-off using an Optane SSD. Uh, and so I, I see, uh, and we're working with customers that we've deployed, uh, um, both into production right now. It seems to just sort of be a, the architectural choice about what type of form factor and product uh, you're going for. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think I talked through most of most of the circle answering those questions, but I would say that, um, you know, the, the Optane SSD is, uh, are, are really showing between five to 20 microseconds under really heavy write pressure. Um, and you know when they're matched with that uh, that faster 100 gigabit e network and the new networking protocols, you know it we're seeing, and I'll show you in a minute. It really pulls us out of the remote storage, you know, I/O cliff, and then back into this window uh, for local storage. And then Optane persistent memory, you know, does it even better? We're seeing you know sub you know one microsecond latencies there, um, with the trade off of just how you pair it with a bit more compute. Um, and then maybe one last thing before I move on, and that is, you know, the, the, the optimal balance between these three hardware ingredients um, in, and what we're seeing in partnering with our customers is to center your system design around maximizing the network throughput. And so, you know, we're saying is like, okay, I, you know, I've got a hundred gigabit E and I want to make sure that that pipe, you know, is fully utilized um, and not letting the compute or the memory and storage bottleneck it. And so that's sort of the... Um, the starting point for the, the optimization balance between those. So, so Allison, can you can you access Optane PMEM through like NVMe over fabric kinds of accesses, or is it it's 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 really just a memory or a PMEM access, right? It's not it's not going to be a storage device per se. So you can uh, you can um, uh, instantiate it as a as a storage over AppDirect as as a, a, a device that you can use as storage with NVMe. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. So it does have that option. Um, uh, you're you're right in that like most of the time um, when we're talking about examples and how customers are using it, they tend to use it more in in a memory mode than a storage. But you can use it as storage, and we do see customers doing so. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to stop, uh, with my, my deep dive into the hardware and, uh, may take a few minutes to show you how the cloud has, uh, been deploying this today and reaping the benefits. Uh, you know, we see cloud vendors either taking these sets of ingredients and building their own disaggregated storage solution, um, or really working to build and buy a, a purpose-built solution with partners. Uh, so the example that, uh, that I'll walk through, um, is with Tencent Cloud. 
uh, and their cloud block storage service. Um, that's kind of very successfully addressed this remote storage IO clip using Optane persistent memory. So this is a case of using persistent memory. Um, so their cloud block storage CBS uh, provides efficient and reliable persistent block storage to support their cloud customer workloads. And then you know, some examples of the ones that they're um, very specifically focused on um, with this uh, CBS um, are high load OLTP financial transaction systems, high throughput e-commerce systems, data analytics for AI, and then high concurrency content delivery networks. That's, that's those are the focus areas for them. Uh, and CBS provides a bandwidth capability of about four gigabits per second and about 1.1 million IOPS on, uh, and then sort of supporting a single disk um, up to about 32 terabytes and then a single cloud host can really scale to like 640 terabytes if they wanna go so far. And the CBS architecture, um, if I start on the left, utilizes traditional disaggregated storage. So it's sort of already set up as, as disaggregated storage. Um, it has a CBS access, a management control cluster, the MBS, and then the CBS storage cluster. And so when a, uh, a read or write uh, request comes in from that CVM cloud host cluster, the CBS access forwards it to the corresponding storage node kind of according to the routing information that's been provided by that MBS. And while this system is high performing, the Tencent cloud had customers that hesitated using it for their cloud block storage. And that hesitation was latencies in the network trans transmissions provide that created a performance gap to local storage. So that gap, that IO cliff, really made customers think twice before moving their performance sensitive core database and content delivery network to this the CBS. Um, and Tencent, uh, Tencent Cloud wanted to address this cliff and they worked with Intel to, to innovate. And so there's a couple steps that we took. So um, first, you know, we addressed some of the, the network latencies by inter introducing RDMA, the remote uh, direct memory access for replication, and then doing some very specific storage engine optimizations to eliminate some locks and waiting contentions. So really focusing on, on getting that um, nice and streamlined. And it made a big difference, but the NVMe NAND latency, um, which you'll see kind of in that, that middle top, we're going to the SSC. The, the NAND latencies are still too long. And honestly, when you start doing a lot of write pressure, they, they get fairly variable. And so, uh, the middle uh, column, you know, the top box shows that initial storage design where the host data is coming in. Uh, it's allocated uh, to the corresponding block node, it's cached in pages, and then you have two write operations that are going to those NAND SSDs, one for that business data and the other one for the metadata log. log. Uh, and both those writes have to complete um, in aggregate really before you can respond and say we're done. Um, and it was showing up in their system um, between 10, uh, tens to hundreds of microseconds. And, you know, and that starts to add up and be sort of dominant in that end-to-end -end latency budget with, um, uh, with all the, the optimizations on the networking side. And then, as I mentioned before, and sort of we know is inherent with NAND, the more stress on the system, the more writes on that NAND, and the longer and less deterministic the solution gets. Alison, is this a, you know, uh, like an option from from the from this provider, or is it a standard uh, way to do things? I mean, like uh, having uh, bigger instances, is this a high frequency storage uh, compared to a less uh, performant storage? Yes, yeah, so yeah. I mean, depending on also on the costs. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So Tencent Cloud offers certainly uh, many different uh, options for their customers in terms of you know what they want, what they need uh, for both their their performance as well as their capacity. Um, and so this is for um, some of their higher performance and and high capacity block storage options um, that that they're putting this offering out there. So it's not, uh, it's one of one of their many cloud service offerings as with most hyperscalers, you have a lot of choices. It seems unusual that the write latency for the non-optimized would be less than the read latency. Obviously you must be doing some sort of caching for writes and that sort of stuff as part of the process for their old disaggregated solution. I see how the new one with the optimized with the Optane is, is you know much more what I would consider standard. Writes take you know a certain amount of time longer than reads. 
Uh, yes. Yeah. So I think um, some of that is that combination of uh, reducing um, just overhead in in that networking path. But yes, I uh, I would say uh, I more commonly see yes that the reads are faster than the writes to start with. So I'll keep it with that one. That was just a unique piece of their solution. Um, so maybe I'll finish up the uh, sort of the, the changes they made and then uh, jump over to where you're going with, with the, out, the final outcome and those latencies. Uh, so in, in this new design, um, Tencent incorporated Optane as this ultra fast persistent storage. So now once that hash and page uh, cat is cached, the host data is instantly state, stored on Optane that um, page and block metadata gets updated locally, corresponding to the data area. And then um, there is now a choice actually uh, for, for the application and the user on, depending on how hot or cold the data is, users can further flush that data from PMM to the SSD or just leave it hot and resident on, on the Optane SSD, um, which will also play somewhat into um, the, the read performance. Uh, and so the durable writes, on the storage target are now done within one microsecond. Um, and so uh, the results uh, of, of putting these pieces together were pretty amazing. Um, as you can see on the right, that uh, Tencent Cloud was able to achieve lower latencies um, than both their current disaggregated storage architecture and uh, their traditional direct attach architecture even. Um, so going from that right latency drop 120 microseconds to 60, um, and then uh, 130 to, to 40 um, for reads. And for reads, that is faster than their direct attached storage. Um, and so it was exciting, exciting for me and us and them because we bridged that IO, IO cliff and really made the storage look local. I will move on and hand it to Vivek to go through uh, the next example, which is uh, a different way of uh, implementing Optane for uh, disaggregated storage. Awesome, thanks, Allison. Uh, another custom example that, that we wanted to go over was uh, finance informatic technology services, right? They are um, a cloud service provider who, is, uh, who are based in Germany. And the customers that they cater is specifically for banks and insurance, right? Which means the SLAs and the, the requirements as part of the infrastructure is, is extremely important, right? Given the regulations that you have in Europe and given the performance that banks and insurance companies look for is, is, is a pretty high standard, right? So they were doing this, the, the requirements and the way they were satisfying those requirements was using direct attached storage. And once they started scaling to, to a large base, they figured out that the cost of their deployment using direct attached storage was pretty expensive, right? It was not a, a model where they could scale to support larger larger customer base. They wanted a solution where they didn't want to change the whole network infrastructure. They wanted to keep the same uh, TCP network that they had as part of the data center. And the other aspect is to make sure that, you know, the performance SLAs that, that the customers were used to still maintain the same, right? As what you would get with direct attach. And the key part of this is the the persistent storage and make sure that if there's any loss of, of a particular node or a data that's residing in the server is there's a replication that's that's happening inside the system, right? And that's another key aspect that they will look at. The fourth one, and, and this, is, this is a common theme that we see around is they wanted a package where everything was put together with Kubernetes that was accessed through direct APIs, right? So cont containers as part of the implementation that they had and make sure that that containerized environment is, is able to satisfy the performance needs, right? So a lot of, lot of key requirements that they had to satisfy, but at the same time, keep the cost low. You know, as part of this requirement, they, they reached out to Lightbits and Intel, and we worked pretty closely with them in figuring out, okay, what is the best way we solve this technology, right? So what we did was we ended up using Lightbit software, which is, which, go, which uses your TCP IP, right? Which is standardized and now you have the NVMU TCP IP that's, that's ratified by, by the board as well. We use that technology 
and made sure that we created a disaggregated architecture. Now you end up separating your compute and you end up separating your storage. You don't need to worry about the direct attached and the cost and you know the efficiency of how, how the direct attached is going to be, right? So once we disaggregated this, uh, we ended up making sure that it was able to meet the you know the strict SLS that I was mentioning early on, and and the right performance characteristics that the customer was looking at, right? And what they figured out is based on the previous deployment that they had, the previous uh, you know the uh, the model that they were doing, uh, and moving to disaggregated with the right hardware components, right? They were able to get 50% better performance compared to what they had in the in the previous architecture, right? And I was mentioning about the cost aspect of reducing the cost of not spending a lot of money on a hardware that you're not going to utilize or spending a lot of money on the software that you're not going to utilize right and that reduced the total cost of of their deployment by 30 percent right so that's that's pretty significant just just taking the right combination of hardware right combination of software and using that as part of the infrastructure that you're building right and Ray, you had asked about a question of you know how does uh, how does Optane fit in in a in a disaggregated architecture, right? Uh, whether how does Optane PMM specifically fit in, right? This is one of the solutions where they end up using Optane PMM as a in an app direct mode, where you can expand the memory, and you can also have a larger storage for using metadata or as a write buffer. Right, so the use case of how Optane is getting used in this type of architecture is pretty efficient. And that basically translates to the customer's savings from a DRAM perspective, right? So you don't need to have a large DRAM footprint now. And you can also have the HA and making sure that the storage is, is persistence as part of what they're deploying. Yeah, in, in this model, like one of the challenges, certainly early with Optane was that you had to choose which mode to run it in. Um, Cause if you're trying to you use it as direct memory access, you've got and have got to re, redo your programs. Is, what mode, so this is using a, a, it looks like it's using light bits as your storage target mm -hmm. and you're using NVMe as the driver to talk to it with standard applications. It, is this doing the, is this making it look like just regular storage and then just as an abstraction and then doing the magic under the covers to give you that acceleration and density bonus? Exactly, yeah, right. So okay. from an application perspective, the application thinks that, hey, my storage is local. It doesn't need to worry about what is happening in the backend, right? What Lightbits does, the LightOver software does, is it figures out that, okay, where do I place my data? And how should I optimize the placement of data so that the performance that the app application sees is, is the best that's coming out of the hardware, right? So to your point, the magic ends up taking place on the LightOS software that figures out, okay, where do I place and how do I use opt-in with, with the NAND device that's there in the back, right? And the application thinks, okay, it's everything is local to me. I don't need to worry about where do I need to place. And an example, right? I'll, I'll give a give a high-level example. Your yeah, my so, and if you could clarify, when, when you say it's local to me, what kind of storage does it, does it look like block? I assume it just looks like block storage that I've presented as, as if I've mounted a local disc, is that right? Exactly, yeah. It looks like okay. a block storage that's mounted on a local disc, right? And, and I'll just add to that. I, that's true of, of, of pretty much all the examples that we have in the specific disaggregated storage space is that what we're, what we're working with um, with our customers to do here is to make it so that for any of the applications, it it just looks like fast block storage that's local, and and it's really through um, through this sort of more infrastructure software that we're able to um, use either persistent memory in both of these examples or SSDs to do that acceleration. And then for the, in the persistent memory case, you know the app it is invisible to the app. You know the app doesn't even really know that persistent memory is there and doesn't have to make choices about it because that infrastructure software is the one that's that knows that you have this new much faster persistent memory in place and is doing that data placement and taking advantage of both the persistence and the fast latency i think i think the key right is is making sure the software that they're using as part of part of the disaggregated architecture is is optimized and is efficient to take the advantage of the underlying hardware right 
I speak with a number of end customers, and one thing that I see is, you know, does software matter? Does hardware matter? It's it's a combination of both. You need to have the right ingredients on both sides to get the best performance and the best TC out of what you're trying to deploy. Right. I have a question, and maybe it's not a question; it's a thought, and 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 I don't want to you know stir any polemics here, but but uh, so. Having this component, which is very powerful and everything, okay, uh, and uh, you know, to enable some software uh, acceleration in the end, doesn't it make uh, the software solution an hardware, you know, focus solution? So we, we lose some of this uh, uh, software defined uh, uh, advantage that we, you know, took it for years about. Uh, the advantages of software define of being able to change the hardware underneath, make it more, uh, let's say, a commodity. And while in this case, you know, yes, I add an accelerator, and I need that accelerator to make it work in the end, because otherwise, uh, so isn't obtained too much of a lock-in in the end? The way you can see it is, opt-in doesn't end up be becoming a lock-in. It gives the customer the option of having a cheaper and a faster option compared to what you would have with a with a DRAM, right? Not faster compared to DRAM, but you know faster compared to the the SSDs that's there in the back, right? So that's one way to look at it, right? And how you how you efficiently deploy it compared to some of the other offerings that are there is where the differentiation comes in. Right, and you're right. To your point, you know, software-defined storage. The biggest benefit of customers deploying it is, is the ease for them, so that they can scale as needed, or they can, they can scale down as needed. Right, and that flexibility is still there. And opt-in gives you another option of deploying it as part of the infrastructure that you have. I'll add. So yeah, as Vivek mentioned, like you can, you can do disaggregated storage without opt-in. You you pay for it with. And be dimmed that you try to scale as much as possible. You stack more capacity of NAND on, and at some point, you're you're just sort of paying for excess capacity that you're not really effectively using because you're trying to stage. Once again, if you're trying to stage and really optimize for that fast network, right? Like that's the pipe, the plumbing pipes. I'm trying to keep full of that fast network. Um, what we're finding, and certainly doing with a lot of our our customers, is that um, Optane just provides this great, powerful tool to have this. This, these staging buffers um, where, where you can put a little bit of fast staging buffer there um, and really just better cost optimize that solution. That doesn't lock out the alternative. It's just sort of a more innovative, efficient way of doing it. Okay. I know that uh, I dragged you through the plumbing of cloud storage <laughs> and made you think about the abstractions of the hardware layer. Um, and uh, as I just mentioned, I, you know, the, the hardware choices that are made at, at the base that the cloud architects are making, they form a foundation for just what you can do. What, what are the, the, the levers, the tools of innovation um, you know, to address this IO cliff? So yes, you can do it without Optane. I'm just gonna argue that it's gonna be harder <laughs> than, uh, you know, than, and you're gonna likely pay more money in the end as you get faster networks than, uh, than using Optane to do so. Uh, and so with this faster 100 gigabit e networking, you get this uh, throughput that's high enough and this latency that's low enough that you couple it with this fast uh, storage node compute and Optane, and that remote storage uh, does appear to applications as local storage, which is, is what we want. That makes the cloud users really happy. I have like infinite local storage. Um, but because it's disaggregated, we can still scale up that capacity independently from the compute, better resource utilization, and that makes the cloud architects very happy. Um, and then maybe I'll finish up, you know, I, uh, we walked through two examples that Eck and I did, uh, the Tencent Cloud who's building their own and then FITS who worked with Lightbits and Intel for an optimized solution. Um, and it was actually kind of tough to, to decide that these were the two to share with you guys today um, because we do have several more deployments um, with CSPs that are using Optane for that faster storage. Uh, there's another PRC um, hyperscaler CSP that's using SS, Optane SSDs in their Elastic Block Store. Uh, JD2Com and Clean Cloud um, have deployed Optane SSDs and persistent memory in their block storage. Um, and so it's just been been very exciting uh, lately to work with the customers to innovate in this space um, and you know see it see it deployed out there. 
um, as 100 gigabit E and faster networking gets broadly deployed.